911, what's your emergency? A female dispatcher's professionally calm voice was proof that my call had finally connected after several failed attempts. Please help me. I I'm locked in a basement. My voice wavered in a terrified manner as I said that. Sir, take a breath and explain to me the situation you're in. The dispatcher's voice remained calm as she asked. I was kidnapped by three men and they have locked me somewhere in a basement. Can you hurry up before they realize I've stolen their phone? I replied in between staggered panic breaths. Listen to me. Stay calm. I already have the police coming at the detected location. As she said that, I heard footsteps coming in my direction, so I hid the phone between the piles of cardboard that were on the side, and the call remained connected. The man in a gray and green shirt whose phone I stole earlier when we came walked toward me in a cold, terrifying manner, grabbed my head from the back. He banged it on the side wall. A scream left my throat as the sudden surge of pain rushed through my skull, along with the leaking blood that was now dripping on the floor. I managed to somehow maintain my balance as my head continued spinning, but the man did not care enough to feel pity for me. He grabbed something, which seemed like a stone, and said something that I couldn't quite understand before hitting me again on my head, which made me pass out in an instant. When I regained consciousness, I was being carried on a stretcher. As I tried to look around in a semi-conscious state, I saw two of the men being arrested before I completely lost consciousness again. The next time I woke up, I found myself in a hospital covered in bandages. An officer was sitting on my side talking to the doctor when they noticed me opening my eyes. They rushed in my direction, the doctor to check on my condition while the officer asked something, but I was still on the effects of the meds and hadn't regained complete consciousness. I could not hear what he was trying to ask me. He realized that I was in no condition to answer any of his questions, so he took off after saying something to the doctor. I was in that state for another two hours before regaining my senses, and as soon as I did, I tried to tell the nurse something. But looking at me speaking, she rushed to the doctor to inform him about me. The doctor immediately came to me and started asking if I could see, hear, and speak clearly. He also asked if I was feeling any discomfort or any added sound in my head. As I was slowly answering each of his questions, the officer that was here earlier came as well. The officer asked if he could ask me some questions regarding what happened, and as I heard this, the memory started to rush back of the horrifying incident. But before answering his questions, I wanted to check something. Where is my sister? I asked with a stutter, which made the officer's face form a confused expression. What do you mean your sister? There was no other victim besides you. As he told me, I started to feel my breathing become heavy in a state of panic. There was no way they couldn't find my seven-year-old sister, as she had been there with me locked in the basement crying when the man was hitting me. The doctors rushed as they noticed my condition getting worse and injected me with something, which made me sleepy. And before I passed out, I heard the doctor say to the officer, Please refrain from asking serious questions, as his condition is not yet completely stable. I don't know how many times I woke up after that crying and screaming in pain, asking for my sister, and how many times I was put back to sleep within the week. The officer visited me often, trying to ask me questions that could help his investigation, but I was never in the condition to tell him my story. It was the eighth day since I was brought to this hospital, when I once again regained consciousness. The officer was still in the hospital, and so as soon as he heard the news of me waking up, he rushed to my side. I was not panicking this time when he asked me to tell him what happened. I started my story with the day that I and my little sister Casey were having our peaceful lunch, and our uncle, who was the only other brother of our deceased mom, dropped by our house with two tickets to the amusement park. His sudden unannounced presence after five years was quite alarming, so I refused to take the tickets and the money he was offering. Mason, my son, I understand you have pride, but let little Casey enjoy sometimes. I know I'm too late, but I want to be there for you guys. He tried to convince us. 
I looked at Casey and her eyes seemed sparkling because due to her poor financial status, she had never once gone to an amusement park like all the other kids her age. I thought about what harm my little trip could cause, so I accepted the tickets and the money he offered with a thank you. He told us that he had some work to do, so he won't be able to join us. After finishing up my part-time work by the evening, I got Casey ready, and we headed to the amusement park. When we were waiting at the bus stop for the bus to arrive, a car stopped in front of us. The driver pulled down the mirror and asked if we wanted to hitchhike. I refused, but they told us that the bus might take a while since there had been an accident down the road, so it would be better for us to take the ride. I hesitantly agreed, and the two of us got in the back seat when they started the car. As they were driving, I noticed the route to be the opposite of where we were supposed to go, so I opened my mouth to ask them. But then, all of a sudden, a wet cloth was on my nose and I passed out. I woke up in a shabby looking basement where Casey was sitting at a corner, hiding her face between her knees as she was trembling in fear. I don't know how long we were there, but they did not provide us with any food or water. It must be around the morning time when a man in a gray and green suit came to check on us. I lunged at him in an attempt to attack, and in doing so, I carefully sneaked his cell phone and slid it into the corner. He kicked me away from him, and then went back up. It was then that I called 911 and informed them about the kidnapping. But we neither found the man you just described nor your sister, the officer told me after hearing my story. It must be him who took my sister and escaped. Please, officer, find her. I have no one else in this world besides my sister. I was pleased while crying with hiccups. The officer assured me that they will do everything in their power to find my sister and the man. My uncle was also arrested for being the mastermind behind the kidnapping. When confronted with the evidence by the detectives, he admitted the truth that there was a huge amount of insurance money in my and Casey's name, which was deposited by my mother before she had died. He wanted to take the money by making it seem like we had died in an accident, but the kidnappers started to demand money before murdering us more than what they had originally discussed. The two arrested men confirmed his story to be true, and they were charged with kidnapping and attempted murder. The search for my missing sister and the man continued when one day, a call was received on the 911 dispatch center from the 300 block of Southeast a construction site. A worker had found a seven-year-old girl in a terrible state who had told him to be an escapee from a kidnapping. A team was immediately dispatched and the girl was identified as my sister Casey. She was immediately taken to the hospital where I was already admitted. I cried in relief for hours that my sister was finally found, but the whereabouts of the third man were still not discovered. Upon asking Casey, she did not speak a word to the officers about how she managed to escape or where that man must be now. After getting discharged, the two of us went back to our house, and the same night when I was trying to sleep, Casey came into my room crying. As I was trying to calm her, she told me something that I had to hide for the rest of our lives. I killed him, brother. He tried to do something horrible to me. So I killed him. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought the car was on the other side of the highway. Sure enough, the white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed, at least 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk idiot drivers in the middle of the night so I pulled to the side of the road and let him pass me. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit and mile marker I was at, 
told me they would send a car. The state police station was only a few exits away, so I figured that they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern PA, and traffic at 3 a.m. tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed, so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams, making it uncomfortable to drive and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan and had just called about a different white Ford sedan, so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car, they had a roof rack and it could have looked like I had reached for a gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt with me and assured me that they sent somebody out. We sent a trooper out to find the car, sir. Listen, I only ask because somebody's following me and acting weird. It could be a cop, and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Are you pulled over? No, they didn't turn on their lights. Let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking, the car again sped towards me and stopped inches from the bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed the brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. What's happening? Did you honk? That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you, sir. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over. I'm speeding, and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate and the person behind me just kept up with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit then bail on it but they followed. At the next exit I took the off ramp and continued on to the on ramp and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought about trying to go to a Wawa, which is a convenience store gas station that's pretty much the only populated place in southeastern PA at 3 a.m., but the dispatcher and I thought that would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person trying to send police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was only one exit away, I told her I was coming there and she said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off to the exit the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went to find the car and I stayed with the third trooper. I thanked the dispatcher and her supervisor and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify so I can only assume the person hasn't been caught. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. How dare you? That's my 12-year-old daughter we are talking about. She was a gem, the kind of child every parent dreams of having, so I know what I'm talking about when I say that she would never run away from home. I shouted at these good-for-nothing cops who had been doing nothing but wasting time for the past four days since Anya went missing. We're just asking that because there are no signs of kidnapping. 
one of them said. My daughter went out of the house to meet her friend but never reached there. Do you think this is something other than kidnapping? I said in a frustrated voice. Why do you keep insisting that she did not run off? Are you the one who kidnapped and murdered her? Another cocking looking officer said, which made me pissed. Are you implying a mother kidnapped her child whom she gave birth to? I moved closer and said, Let's be real, you're a single working mom with no one to rely on and your daughter's the result of your rape, so it won't be a surprise if you decide to kill the offspring who bring back the memories of the monster who gave you a lifetime of trauma. He said with another big cocky smile, which made my blood boil. Watch your damn mouth before I rip it apart. And trust me, I don't give a damn that you're a cop. I said gritting my teeth. I was this close to losing it and punching him in the face. We understand ma'am that you're upset about your daughter and I apologize on behalf of Officer Trevor. But we are doing our best to find her. The first cop said in a soft tone trying to calm me down but I was too angry, sad, and frustrated to understand, so I left without saying another word. What was even more frustrating and hurtful was that cop Trevor was right. Anya was the constant reminder of the pain I had suffered, but I pitied her more than I ever resented her. Anya was the only good thing that had happened to me after my mother lost me in a gamble, which resulted in me getting brutally molested. I ran away after that while being pregnant with the monster's child, but I'm aware of the fact that my life would have been if it wasn't for my daughter. So I love her more than anything in my life because she was an innocent little child. As the cops told me they were looking for my child, but they weren't looking hard enough, so I decided to take matters into my own hands and began my investigation. Even though I couldn't think straight being worried about her, I remembered every little detail before she went missing. She was being persistent about going over to her friend Lindsay's house for a sleepover. Even though I did not want to let her go, I eventually gave in and let her go. But when I called Lindsay to check on Anya, she told me she never made it. I spent the entire night looking for her, but couldn't find her. So the next morning, I reported it to the police. I checked all the surveillance cameras I could find, but I found nothing. As I was thinking about how to get my daughter back, I heard a knock on the door. I walked there, and as I opened it, there was no one around. Thinking it must be a prank, I was about to turn when I saw a note lying on the doorstep. I opened the note, and it read, If you want your daughter back, Meet me at this address tomorrow at 9 p.m. and don't tell anyone. I read the address written there, and it wasn't that far away from my place. I impatiently waited for the morning, and then for the day to pass. The day was feeling longer than any other day, as if it was going at the speed of a sloth, but somehow it passed, and finally the time arrived for me to head to the address. As I reached the back alley of a pub, I noticed no one was around, so I started to wait for someone to arrive, and that was when I heard the voice that sent me crawling down my body. I turned to see and froze from the unexplained terror that I felt at that moment. Kayla, you look still as beautiful as ever, he said with a disgusting grin on his face which was terrifying me. Where's my daughter? I asked hesitantly, with my voice trembling. You mean our daughter, right? His smile got even bigger. Yes, it was him. Mason. The man who raped me 13 years ago. Did you kidnap Anya? Where is she? What did you do to her? I asked while trying to build up all the courage needed to save my daughter. Nothing. I just wanted to bond my relationship with her. The moment these words came out of his mouth, the anger in me built up again, enough to want to wipe that dirty smirk off of his face. If you were to even touch my daughter, I said. He came closer and cut me off in between. Oh, I would never hurt her. Not if you come back to me. His dirty grin was getting bigger and bigger by the minute. 
You know that's not going to happen, I said while backing off. Well, if you want your daughter back, then you surely will. He grabbed my hand, pulled me, and placed a forceful kiss. I couldn't say anything and froze in fear. I started to feel sick, as if I would throw my stomach out. I tried to control the disgust and followed his command. There had to be something that I could do to get my daughter back and get rid of this monster. That was when we reached a shabby looking place that seemed like an apartment. I took a glance around the neighborhood, which did not seem nice, as if a murder could happen any moment. As I thought that, it gave me an idea. Anya! I ran toward the bed where she was tied up and I was about to untangle her rope. That monster grabbed my hand and pulled me away from her. At the same moment, I picked up the vase sitting around on the table with my other hand and smashed it into his head. He lost balance and I kicked him between his legs, making him groan in unbearable pain. Several empty alcohol bottles were lying around, so I grabbed one, broke it, and stabbed him with it. After that, I immediately ran toward Anya, untied her, and then ran outside with her. I was terrified, and my heart was beating like crazy, but I had made my decision. There was not a hundred percent surety that he would die, so I called the cops and told them everything, but not before packing our stuff and leaving the place. As I was getting out of town, I could not help but remember all the precious memories I had spent together with my daughter. And now that she had experienced a bad one, it was time to share the truth with her that I tried so hard to hide from her. On November 16th of 2004, 64-year-old Datmitra Simjanos had disappeared after visiting a meat market in her hometown of Kashava, North Macedonia. Just less than two months later, on January 12th of the following year, police found her dead body. She had been strangled, bound, tortured, and violated, but had only been dead for about two weeks, meaning she had been kept prisoner somewhere and continually tortured for quite some time. Almost three years later, in November of 2007, 56-year-old Beat Selakaska disappeared while walking almost the exact same route as the murdered Mitra. She too was found early the following year, having received very similar treatment to Mitra. Then, May of 2008, 65-year-old Zivaza Tamilkaska received a call saying that her son had been hospitalized. She disappeared on her way to the hospital, and it was later revealed that her son was in picture-perfect health. Her body was found a few days later. Unlike the previous two victims, she had been bound with telephone cords before being tortured, violated, and strangled. Macedonia police were reportedly mystified by the murders, and there was a complete lack of cooperative forensic evidence at the scene, meaning the killer had no previous convictions, and the only connections between the three women was that they were all employed as cleaners for a collection of different temp agencies. Aside from that, there was no motive, no evidence, and no way of knowing who the killer might be. It most certainly made for an interesting case, and as word spread among the people of Keith Chevelle that they had potential killer in their midst, panic began to set in. The murders had also gained the interest of a 56-year-old journalist named Vlado Tanoski, a veteran reporter who spent his career at two of Macedonia's most prestigious newspapers, and Milana began his own private investigation into the murders, detailing his work in a series of articles that were published in the likes of Nova Macedonia and New Trinsk Vink. The Macedonia public were gripped by the articles, and for a while, it seemed as if Vlado might actually uncover the identity of the man they called the Kid Share Vault Monster. To them, Blanco was a hero, with the articles turning him into a national sensation and reviving what had been a floundering career. But it was during a read of one of the articles that a Macedonia homicide detective noticed something strange. Indeed, the articles were superbly written and pinpoint accurate. Yet to the detective, 
they seemed a little too good. Vlado was privy to a level of detail that could only have come from actually reading the case files, and sharing such documents with a journalist constituted either gross incompetence or possible corruption amongst the presiding officers. An extensive investigation was undertaken, but the source of the leak couldn't be found. In fact, informal security surrounding the investigation was positively airtight. And that's when it occurred to one officer that there was a second explanation to why Vlado knew so much about the murders. One they had to explore, no matter how unthinkable it was. In January of 2008, Vlado received a visit from a pair of homicide detectives who wished to discuss his articles with him. He was only too happy to answer their questions, believing his work was actually helping them catch the killer. And in a way, that's exactly what happened. Because when the police asked Vlado how he knew that the killer had used telephone cord to find Dust victims, the journalist fell silent. It was explained to him that only the investigating detectives were aware of this piece of information, and unless he could point the finger at the collaborating officer, Vlado had some serious explaining to do. When he failed to account for where such knowledge had come from, the police asked him to provide a DNA sample for use in the ongoing investigation. They assured Vlado that it would be used to rule him out of the investigation, and then, if he had nothing to hide, he had nothing to worry about. But Vlado did have something to hide, because when law enforcement compared Vlado DNA to a sample taken from the victim's corpse, it came back a match. The police had finally discovered the identity of the Kashava monster and was flooded with Jinsky himself. Following the Vlado arrest, the police built up a picture of the man who Sharp the client had driven him to violent insanity and the 18 months before the first murder took place, Vlado's father had taken his own life. His mother accidentally overdosed on prescription medication and he was laid off from his job. On top of that, he and his wife apparently separated when she moved to the Macedonia capital of Scorpia. Police then moved to search the Tenacity's family's holiday home, a cottage in the countryside that they often summer that it was there. The police uncovered a huge cache of adult material, ropes, and cords, which they used to tie to victims and items belonging to the women Vlado had killed. The yet in a bizarre twist, police also discovered that Vlado's mother had been employed as a cleaner for most of her adult life, the same profession shared by his victims. This made for an extremely chilling addendum to the investigation, opening up the possibility that Vlado had suffered a complete mental break and had targeted the women because they resembled or even smelled like his mother. The salsa suggested that he'd had a fraught relationship with her something his wife and friends said they were almost totally unaware of. Macedonia police were also planning on questioning Vlado regarding the disappearance of 73-year-old retired cleaner Gorsia Pavleshi, which had occurred on May of 2003. But following his transfer to Totovo prison, Vlado was found dead in his prison cell on June 23rd. He had apparently drowned himself in a plastic bucket of water his only means of taking his own life. It was an anticlimactic end to a story that had rocketed Macedonia society. The idea that a man was so desperate for the respect and admiration of his peers that he would literally kill for it, and that somehow, in the course of his violent campaign of murder and deception, he ended up targeting women that reminded him of his own mother.